No surprise, I will be taking St. Thomas Aquinas as a kind of guide for talking about the angels, not just because we're Dominicans and feel the need to always rely on him, but because he really stands out as one of the best theologians in the history of the church for talking about the angels. He's someone who tells us perhaps the most more than any other theologian. And he gives us a vision of reality in which the angels occupy an important place. Part of the reason we might think that he's often called the angelic doctor. So I'll be referring a lot to St. Thomas, and you can think of basically most of the principles I'm going to say are really coming out of St. Thomas Aquinas' theology. So my talk has four parts. The first, I'll just talk about the existence of the angels, but then um, really the largest part of the talk, or the, the last three things I'll talk about, are, the way, are, are really why we should care about the angels, why we should give them thought, why we should give them some time for a little bit of systematic study. So just beginning with their existence. Well, how do we know that angels exist? We ask ourselves this. Well, okay, they're mentioned in the liturgy. Well, we see them mentioned in the scriptures, of course. The name angel means messenger. So in a way, it tells us their occupation rather than what they really are. Um, they're messengers of God. And we see in the scriptures that angels deliver messages to the patriarchs. We see the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation delivering the message of the Incarnation to Our Lady. We see Raphael in the book of Tobit occupying an important place. So that's the scriptures. It's an easy answer, and in some ways it's the best. But there's also a way in which our human reason can tell us something about the angels. It's a tricky question we don't have perfectly good answers for. But we can at least gesture towards knowing that the angels exist just by using something of our human reason. Now, uh, if anyone's looked into St. Thomas's proofs for the existence of God, um, which I won't go through here, but just a principle at play there that we can know that God exists because he does certain things. He creates and we can learn something about his creation and kind of reflect on the Creator. We can go from the effect to the cause. Well, the trouble with the angels is, is this. It's very simple. is that there's nothing really that the angels do that God couldn't do himself directly. Nothing that we see that the angels do that God himself couldn't do directly. So there's that principle at work that we can't really tell, and this is where, this is maybe the least satisfying aspect of, of this whole discussion. Because you may want, um, I don't know, an angel detector or something. You want to say, I want to know whether what happened there was the result of an angel or whether this bad thing over here that happened was the result of a demon. And the answer is, well, you can't really know aside from some special revelation. And nor should we take upon ourselves to try to ferret out every last little bit of certainty. Well, God, tell me, was this an angelic influence or was this a demonic influence? So we have to have a little bit of humility when we talk about the angels, because there's certain things we just can't know. Because, again, there's nothing that they do, again, nothing good that the angels do that God, in a way, couldn't do himself. At the same time, there's also a principle at work, and that is that God likes to use intermediaries. God likes to use messengers and ministers. We even see ourselves in part of our Christian vocation and spreading the gospel, building up the body of Christ. We have our own important role to play. The Lord doesn't need us, strictly speaking, but he wants us to be involved. He wants to use us. And in the same way, he uses the angels as part of his own providential government. I'm realizing I'm falling behind on my slides. You might be thinking, well, when's something new going to happen? So there's just the overview of the talk as a whole. And now here's where we're at. So I covered a little bit of the popular objections and also talked a little bit about the scriptures. Now I'm in that philosophical arguments part. So we can take a little bit of a different approach. Um, there's a typo actually in my notes that says, there is another angel St. Thomas takes. When you're talking a lot about the angels, it's easy to say angle and, and mistype it as angel. <laughs> the angels are somehow necessary for the perfection of the universe. And this gets into, well, really what an angel is. And I think this is where you see especially the unique 
contribution of St. Thomas Aquinas, that every other creature is made up of material stuff, but angels are entirely without matter. You know, even we as human beings have a body and a soul. And so if we look at things from God's perspective, uh, we might also then think about why it's fitting, why it was important for God to make the angels, why it was important that he create a creature that's just pure spirit. It's more perfect to have a universe that has angels. And in a way, that's kind of the angle to go, that there would be something missing from creation if God hadn't created a whole group of beings that are purely spiritual beings. And like I said, we see some of this just in the intuition of various cultures, that there's some intermediate grade of being. There's something there that, well, people don't quite have a complete proof for or complete proof of, but there's an intuition. For instance, St. Thomas uses this as, as an example in one place. He says, well, how would you explain demonic possession? Which, you know, as we see in the scriptures and the gospel itself, there's various examples of. And not just, uh, we're not just talking about medical problems. Obviously, in a more primitive time, people attributed certain, you know, conditions like epilepsy to a seizure to a seizure that's really a matter of an angel, or a demon, rather, uh, influencing someone. But, so St. Thomas makes the point, well, how exactly would you explain all of those bad things that happen through some uh, negative spiritual influence without at least that category to deal with? Anyway, by and large, I, I take you as a pretty friendly audience who already believes about angel, already thinks that angels exist. And so maybe this question isn't, near, isn't as relevant But it's worth considering, especially for all of those out there who, if we were to bring up, well, angels and demons, they're real. Um, All of those folks who would sort of laugh at us. But why should we study the angels? Why should we spend time thinking about them, about their place in creation? Well, the first reason, maybe even the best reason, is that it's actually delightful. It brings a kind of joy to consider something so noble and lofty. One of the best quotes, I think, uh, in Thomas Aquinas, which he takes from Aristotle in a really obscure work. St. Thomas has this way of taking something from, you know, that's dusty in a closet and shifting it around a little bit and creating this beautiful spiritual point. He does this with one point of Aristotle where he says that the least knowledge of the highest things brings the greatest joy kind of a long sentence. The least knowledge of the highest things brings the greatest joy. So, you know, when we're in school and we're learning all sorts of complicated things, like say in math class or all sorts of complicated things in science, there's a frustration there sometimes that, oh, this is hard to learn. But once an insight hits you, once a little bit of truth hits you, even if it was hard to come by, there's a kind of joy that results. Like, ah, I get it now. Those those moments when we say, I get it. I have this insight about the nature of the world that God suddenly allowed me to come to. Well, the least knowledge we have of the highest things brings that kind of joy. And St. Thomas uses this to really talk about God, ultimately. Our joy, our happiness is found principally in God. Um, God makes us happy. But there's also other things, other truths, to contemplate and learn that bring us joy and delight. And one of those is found in contemplating the angels, meditating on them. You know, we really should be proud of the whole picture as Christians that our faith offers us because there's a comprehensiveness to it all that brings delight. There's something thrilling about getting a taste of something vast and beyond us. You know, if you think about it this way, even just like a basic analogy to a vacation, you know. You don't leave the beach disappointed that you couldn't swim across the whole ocean, you know. It says, well, we went to the beach, but I wasn't able to conquer it. Um, no, you're happy just to dip your toes in the water. You're happy just to enjoy an afternoon at the beach. 
Well, spending even just a little time thinking about the angels, I would say, introduces us into a transcendent world of literally billions of spiritual creatures, each diverse and precious. And when we think about it, this is a world not separate from our own, but one which intersects with it in many important ways. A lot of other people object and say that the only things worth studying are those that we can completely grasp and understand. But, well, they might lack a little creativity. They're wrong, because there's joy in the truth no matter what little grasp we can have of it. Don't we take delight in knowing, like, trivial facts? You know, well, maybe some people more than others, but they come in handy in all of those trivia games, right? All of those. You want them on your team in the trivia challenge. Well, if we take delight in knowing trivial little facts, all the more so with knowing something as awesome as the angels. The difficulty, though, is there's a kind of intellectual rigor required. This is why more people don't spend time thinking about the angels. It's because it's hard. You have to sort of push your mind to go up higher. And if we follow Aquinas through his discussion of the angels, it's really a, a mental and spiritual workout. We have to use um, philosophy, and not only philosophy, but the highest branch of philosophy, metaphysics, and theology. And we have to kind of use words and then purify them, slice our concepts thinner and thinner, uh, more delicately than we ever thought possible. So thinking about the angels, another reason for it is it gives us a kind of intellectual exercise. The second reason for thinking about the angels is that it purifies our notion of ourselves. And I really think this is, I mean, this is personally why I like to talk to people about angels. This is why it's one of my favorite topics, is because it immediately causes someone to reflect on human nature. It's almost like we need to have a case of something different before we can really think about ourselves. We have a tendency to think, well, everything is just like us, or we're just like everything else. But if we actually spend some time thinking about what the angels are and their place in God's creation, it immediately brings into light, into relief, certain important facts, very important facts about ourselves. Um, and just in general, I'll tell you up front, there's this tendency for us, I think, to think ourselves a little bit more like the angels than we actually are. And so when we think about the angels, it, it gives us a necessary kind of humility. It also shows us our great dignity, too, to kind of situate ourselves, you know. What are human beings? Well, we're somewhere between the chimpanzees and the guardian angels, you know. There's a big gap, but we're in there somewhere. So I really think most people's, um, many people's, religious and spiritual problems come very often not just from a bad idea about God, but from a poor understanding of the human person. So that's why I think this is all the more important to talk about human nature, comparing and contrasting with the angels. Discussing the angels gives us a new vantage point because we can understand what we have in common with them and how we're different from them. Okay, here's, here's one line to latch onto and to remember from this talk. St. Thomas says that the intellect of an angel surpasses the human intellect much more than the intellect of the greatest philosopher surpasses the intellect of the most uncultivated simple person. For the distance between the best philosopher and a simple person is contained within the limits of the human species, which the angelic intellect surpasses. Okay, that's a long sentence, but it's, there's a really, you can almost draw it. Um, it's, it's a simple point in a way. It says, if we were to put the simplest person we could find next to the smartest person we could find, the difference between them would pale in comparison to the difference between, well, let's say, a genius, a Mozart, an Einstein, and even the lowliest of angels, the lowliest of guardian angels, let's say. So we shouldn't overlook this insight, and I think it's meant to put us in our place so we can approach the angels with a kind of wonder. You know? So if you take everybody's intellectual abilities all in one group here, and we, we put them together, if we were to anyone we could find out there, we say, well, this is, a very this is someone who's limited, this is someone who's a genius. That distance, although it seems to us a lot, is actually 
just a hair by comparison to the distance between that genius and the closest of angels. It's an important principle, I think. It shows you that there's a, a giant leap there um, going from even what we think is the smartest person who's ever lived to, well, an angel who's just being himself and doing his job. It gives us a way to uh, sort of begin understanding ourselves and our place in creation. I think this is where it's important to uh, think about our knowledge. Just if we were to say, okay, angels and men, what's the big difference? Well, let's just focus on knowledge. What is it that we know and how do we know? Well, if you think about it, everything we know in some ways starts with our five senses. You know, we see something, we hear something, we feel something. It starts there, and that all sort of goes through our body, into our brains, through our nervous system. We create a kind of image for what we're seeing and experiencing. And then from that, through a, a very incredible process, we kind of begin to draw some principles and to be able to understand what things are. You know, Think about, as a child, what it must have been like for you to see a dog for the first time. You know? If you didn't grow up in a family with a dog, uh, where the dog even predated you, um, let's say you go over you know, to someone's house and, and, and they have a dog. And as a child, you're just kind of in wonder, like, look at this animal. You know, even kids who aren't around uh, pets very much, you see them, um, I'm thinking of my nieces and nephews coming over to grandma and grandpa's house with a dog and the dog doesn't enjoy the visit that much. And the little white dog that gets terrorized because um, she gets so much attention from these kids who are who are um, enthralled by this other creature. So what is it as a child to begin to see what a dog is? Well, you have to actually like interact with it a little bit. And then you come to, to realize, well, you know, and you see this with kids who will call every dog by the same name that the family dog is. Oh, well, that's a Fido. Well, no, that's just what your dog's name is. And they come to a sense of like, oh, well, there's, this thing belongs to a group. There's all sorts of dogs. That's a whole process that, well, in a way, we're not even aware of because it's what we do as human beings. We learn about things. Um, you know, you might go to the zoo and see animals you've never seen before, even now. You go to the zoo and find a golden tamarind, um, which I think are all owned by Brazil. Uh, and they're like rented out to zoos throughout the country. Fun fact, trivia. So anyway, that's all just a small portrait of how we know things as human beings. There's a process. It involves interacting with the world. And then um, through a really incredible, remarkable psychological process, we come to know things in a universal way. We come to know that, well, there's not just one animal over here and one animal over here. There's dogs. Or there's all of these other animals that we can even group into the category of animal. That's what our knowledge is like as human beings. And it's a process. It takes a long time. What are angels like? And how do they know things? Well, for angels, they're given what they're supposed to know from their very beginning, from their creation. The angels don't have bodies, so they don't have senses. They don't have eyes. They don't have hands. They don't have ears. So how do they know things? Well, just with the ideas that God has given them from their creation. Except those ideas are very um, full. They're comprehensive ideas. It would be like being given, you know, not just an image of a dog, but everything that we could know about dogs, you know, more than the encyclopedia holds on a variety of different subjects. The angels are given to know everything that they're supposed to know about themselves, about God, about their mission and role in the world. That's the angels. And in a way, they're much closer to God in their knowledge because God knows everything he knows, well, by reference to himself. God's self-knowledge is, in a way, the source of all truth and knowledge. And angels, in a way, just sort of look at what the ideas are in them. You could think of that, you know, metaphorically. They, they sort of look inside themselves to find those ideas that God has given them. And so because of that, because they have an immediate, complete knowledge of everything that they know, they don't take time to reason from one thing to another. There's no process involved. Um, so you can feel your minds getting kind of stretched just thinking about what it would it be like to be an angel, right? What would, it be, it's, what would it be like to be an angel? So there's no need to reason from one thing to another. They know everything they know right away. 
immediately from their creation. Which also explains, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the fall of the angels, but we can do that in a question and answer. It explains why the angels were sort of presented with one ultimate choice. You know, for ourselves, we have plenty of time to come to learn about God, to come to accept his grace, um, you know, generally speaking. Uh, but the angels, it was just sort of one moment. They got one chance, uh, and which is part of the great mystery involved in understanding why the demons fell away from God. Um, because, well, if they knew even clearer than Adam and Eve what the stakes were and what it would mean to reject God, why would they? It's a deep mystery at play there. It's hard enough to imagine why Adam and Eve would sin if all they knew were wonderful things and God's grace and charity. So anyway, that's just an aside. But for us, we've got plenty of chances, plenty of movements and motions. I think one of the most profound and wise sayings of Thomas Aquinas is that the angels attained their end by one motion, but we as human beings do so by many motions. The angels basically came into heaven, came into a full vision of God after one decision for him, after one act of charity. But for us, uh, we know we have a lot of work to do. You know? uh, it's, it's a whole lifetime. Um, and I know some days it feels like a longer lifetime than others. <laughs> At the end of a long day, we attain our end by many motions. That's just part of what it is to be a human being. Okay, so I think understanding a little bit about the angels gives us a kind of humility towards ourselves because we realize our knowledge is very limited. If we have to go through like a whole life experience just to figure out what a dog is. Imagine what we have to do to we'll come to a knowledge of God. That's why we need teachers. Imagine what we have to do to come to a knowledge of ourselves. Because we can't just look in the mirror and see our souls. We see our bodies. We don't see our souls. The best image for the soul is the body. So we're, we're getting close, you know, when we look in the mirror. But it gives us a kind of humility to think we don't just see our souls directly. For instance, we can't also see, uh, it's also, you know, sometimes unclear to us when our passions are influencing our reasoning. You ever wake up in the morning and you, you just realize the world is terrible everywhere and everyone is a mean person and everything is going wrong and you think, what's wrong today? Oh, I haven't had coffee yet. <laughs> and then everything gets better or dramatically better after that. Think of the way in which, you know, being tired, um, you know, has an influence on the way you're reasoning. You know, it's not that the world is falling apart, you know, or it's not falling apart in quite the immediate way that you think at that moment at, at 5.30 a.m. But uh, it takes a little bit of time to come to see the way our passions are influencing our reasoning. So that's kind of a silly example, but there's a more profound one we could offer. We can't see our souls in a direct way that an angel can. And so we can't, you know, look upon the surface of our souls and see the grooves of virtue and vice. We can't gaze upon our spiritual life and measure our progress. In some ways, even that is, is a deep matter of faith. We can see concretely, yes, well, I'm doing a little more of this or a little less of this and try to sort of keep track. But we don't have a very good knowledge of ourselves. It's always limited. Our self-knowledge is always limited. And especially the life of grace remains a kind of hidden treasure, as mysterious as the God who causes it in us. This is why, for instance, um, I can talk a little bit more about this, but it's, I think it's an important point. We can't reflect and, and see whether, uh, with absolute certainty, whether we're in a state of grace or not, because we just simply can't see grace in our souls. That would be what it would take. To be a kind of angel looking in a spiritual mirror, I see what I see myself. Now you might say, well, wait, wait Father, but I sp we're not supposed to receive communion if we're not in a state of grace. So how are we ever going to know? And says, well, obviously we know our actions and we can have a kind of reference um, to that. That's why the language is, you know, um, you should refrain from receiving Holy Communion if you're conscious of a mortal sin, right? Conscious of having committed a serious sin. Um, so we have to know a little bit about our actions. We have to think in the past. We can't just um, go through a metal detector that detects whether you have a, 
a mortal sin or not, right? That would make it a lot easier, right? You know? But then it would also become a bit of a game. So there's something the Lord is teaching us in our limited knowledge of ourselves. He only shows us a part of our true selves at a time. And I think ultimately this is a mercy. You know, so not just the issue of mortal sin and, and all of that, but just if we were to think about virtue and vice, we can't like measure, okay, how am I doing in, in uh, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude? We can't look at it in the way the printer tells us when it needs its cartridges, uh, you know, changed. You know, well, we're doing a little bit low on cyan, you know, and the magenta is about to go. You know, I'm bad with prudence. I'm bad with temperance. I'm bad with justice. You know, that's not the way we can look at our souls. It's much less direct than that, which is why the spiritual life is such a kind of discipline and journey and why we need good counsel and uh, why we undertake the practice of the sacraments and humility why we go to confession repeatedly. You know, if the Lord did give us that kind of immediate knowledge of ourselves, I think it would be a little overwhelming. Um, it would be like sort of being at the judgment seat of the Lord all the time. Um, but mercifully, he, he makes our faults evident to us a little bit at a time, you know? Um, when something's kind of on our heart and the Lord's brought it to us in prayer a lot, um, well, maybe that's just what he wants you to focus on then and there. So that's our knowledge of ourselves and how it's limited. Our knowledge of God is also very limited. Um, so the angels know that God exists just by looking at themselves. They're like, okay, I exist, so there must be a God that exists. It's a little bit more complicated for us. We have to go through, like I said, a process of reasoning and moving from effects to causes. There's other ways in which we have some very profound things in common with the angels. Um, you know. Obviously, our spiritual soul is immaterial. Our, the spiritual soul that we have, we talk about our soul, the immortality of the soul. We pray for the souls in purgatory. Um, our soul has, we have an intellect and a will. Uh, we are body and soul put together as human beings, but our soul has this incredible potential. The ability to receive God's grace, a supernatural destiny with God, uh, and then looking forward to the resurrection, having our bodies joined again to our souls, so, you know, while we're, like I was saying, there's a huge difference between us and even the lowest of angels. At the same time, we sort of stand shoulder to shoulder with them when it comes to going to heaven, when it comes to being with God forever. Um, there's, you know, we make the cut, in other words. We're the kind of thing that can go to heaven. Your dog can't go to heaven. Sorry to break the news. Um, it's, he just doesn't have the capacity. He doesn't have a spiritual soul. Um, Okay, there's a whole lot of other things we could say why, why we have it, you know, in some ways even better than the angels. Uh, there's something unique about us in the fact that we summarize creation. Think about it. There's nothing else that God created that's both standing in the spiritual world and the material world at the same time. I think that explains why we're so complicated, right? That's one way to have insight into it. There's nothing else God created that joins the spiritual world and the material world in every thing, in every person, in every individual. Uh, there's a profound mystery there. So God with us is sort of summarizing all of his creation together. It's really profound to think of. Also, there's a way in which human parents, by uh, being able to create or concrete with God, procreation, uh, being able to give rise to children, that's something angels don't do. God just makes angels. There's the number there was when he started, and they stay. Uh, but they don't have angel families, right? They're a little bit more on, on their own as individuals. Also, we can think of how Jesus Christ has become man. Jesus Christ didn't join his divine nature to an angelic nature. But he did join. Um, the Son did become man in the incarnation, and even remains man by ascending into heaven. Of course, we know. The Lord is there forever with his humanity. He's not going to discard his humanity. Then we know, of course, too, that the Blessed Virgin Mary occupies uh, a role even above the angels, even above the highest of angels, because of her connection to Christ, because of her role in our salvation uh, as the mother of God. She's also, we, we use that title, and it means what it says. She's the queen of the angels. She's above all of the angels. 
OK, so those are great things we can say about, you know. So I, I always want to, you know, both give us a dose of humility, but also say, well, what are the important and profound things that we share in common with the angels? And what is also something uh, that shows us our special place in creation? You might be wondering now, I've talked more about human nature. But I, again, I really think that's one of the main reasons to reflect on the angels. OK, so now back to angels a little bit. And maybe the moment you've been waiting for, if this is a question that bugs you, it says, what do angels and demons do? And how do we know when they're doing it? It's a general principle for Aquinas that, that God is so good that he wants not only to share his goodness, but to give creatures the ability to share goodness with other creatures. That's a mouthful, but it's profound. God's so good, he not only delights in sharing his goodness with others, but in giving them the ability to share, if that makes sense. So that's a general principle, but it shows us that um, there's something really profound that God gives us the dignity of being causes, the dignity of helping to govern the world, and not only to us, but in an even more profound way to the angels. It's true that the angels exist principally for the glory and praise of God. We could say that of ourselves, too. But there's certain angels that have a mediating role. Remember, the title, of course, means messenger. Certain angels have a mediating role in regard to human beings. So we could ask, what exactly can angels, as well as demons, do? And does their power have any limitations? We might think, well, that they can do anything God does, because they're in that sort of spiritual zone. But that's not quite true. We might ask ourselves, well, can angels work miracles? Can angels work miracles? I think if we were to just ask most Catholics that, they would say, well, yeah, they're angels. They can do all kind of that. They can do tons of spiritual stuff. This is where it's important to, to distinguish between, well, things that are just beyond our human powers and things that are beyond the power of any creature. You know, only God can do miracles in the true sense, where he just completely exceeds the limits of creation. Only God can do those kind of miracles. Only God can tell the future, right? Um, and when a prophet says the future, it's through knowledge given him by God, right? The angels don't have knowledge of the future. They're very good guessers, though. Um, they would be much better than the weatherman about knowing what, what the weather is going to be. The angels don't have a perfect knowledge of the future, so they're limited. They can't work miracles in the same way. Now, they can do things that we can't, um, so they can act in a, in a way that's above us, supernatural sort of, um, supernatural because it's above our nature, superhuman nature, but they do have limitations. This is where um, it's important to, yeah, I mean, what are examples? And, you know, when you, when you read about, like, for instance, things that exorcists have seen, uh, maybe you can come up with some examples. Like, well, angels can move things. And um, in a way, we could say the same of demons. Angels and demons can't create anything. That belongs to God alone. He alone can bring something from nothing into existence. He alone can give life and breath and existence to things. There's also a, an interesting way in which angels can't act upon the intimate core of the human person, our, our mind and our heart, our intellect and our will. Angels can't choose for us, and they can't exactly infuse our minds with ideas and choices in our core. Now, this is where I'm going to be making a distinction. But they can suggest things to our imagination. You know, I think oftentimes people think of demons doing this, but it's also true of the angels. They can suggest things to our imagination. They can act upon, well, that aspect of us. They can give us ideas. So in a way, give us images, I should say. Um, so in a way, you can think of being tempted by demons is a matter of persuasion. Um, no creature can force us to do anything, you know, in our intimate core. Um, can, can choose, a, can make us actually make a choice. Um, but they can suggest things. So the angels can enlighten us through suggestion of good things and the demons bad things. You can think too of miracles uh, like healings. If, if, you know, we see, let's say in the Old Testament, um, a healing coming about through the influence of an angel. 
uh, well, it's through an ordinary process of healing. It's not ex that's accelerated. It's not as though uh, we see angels walking around or influencing people in the way that Christ does and that the kinds of miracles he's doing. There's certain things that Jesus does in the gospel that not only reveal he's special and a prophet sent by God, but that reveal that he is God. Um, certain things that only he can do. So this is where we have to be also kind of limited in our knowledge. Exactly when an angel acts in a given situation is almost impossible to surmise. It's very difficult for us to say anything conclusive about a particular situation, which is often the most pressing question, right? And we say, what just happened? Was that the influence of a demon? Or I just had this sudden thought come to me. Or I feel like I was pushed out of the way from the bus that was about to run over me. Was that an angel at work? Maybe. I think we need to be completely open to those possibilities. Um, it's good to have a, a kind of awareness of that as a possibility. And this is where I think the devotional life of the church really concretizes this, you know, with the angel of God prayer, with the St. Michael prayer. Um, it's, it's, there's a reason there. There are two of the prayers that uh, are the most common for Catholics to know. Now, people may begin to get uncomfortable or, feel, or fearful at the thought about demons, and it's certainly possible to go overboard. And you hear this in the way some people talk. You know, some Christians talk as though they have certain knowledge of the devil in every difficult situation or evil action. Um, they say, you know, well, this was definitely the devil. It's like, well, okay, I, it's possible, but I don't claim to have the ability to tell that right here and now. It's true, it's, uh, it's true that, you know, especially with the scriptures show us, with revelation and tradition shows us that, uh, you know, there is demonic activity at work, right? But saying exactly what happened here and now in the particular is something we can't really draw a conclusion on. The devil and his minions are not the primary cause of all evil in the way that God is the primary cause of all good. The devil is not the primary cause of all evil in the way that God is the primary cause of all good. This is very important. And Dominicans have been making this point since the beginning because the Albigensians that St. Dominic preached against, this conception that there was an evil God who created all the material things and all of the bad things and all of sin, uh, and then there was a good God who created all of the spiritual things and all of those, uh, yeah, and souls, all of those things. You can see how when you emphasize the work of the devil a little bit too much, uh, how someone can go towards that tendency. Um, you know, the devil doesn't have an exclusive copyright on all evil. I think we can all kind of attest that we've given our part into doing bad things. Um, and like I said, that influence, you know, the devil doesn't have a sovereignty over us in the way that God does as our creator. You know, even in someone that's, that's possessed, or let's say like the worst case scenario. Um, even in that case, the inner core of the person is, though very much troubled, and you know, uh, it's very dark and scary, um, that person belongs to God. Uh, we can also talk a little bit about why God might allow these things to happen. And it's important to say that everything is situated within God's providence, um, so that even when the devil is at work, it's still forming part of God's plan in a mysterious way. You know. The devil is not actually gaining ground on that. So, while Christians hold that Satan tempted the first humans, it doesn't mean that every subsequent sin occurs because of his prompting. Many of our sins are simply because of the weakness of our fallen nature and our tendency to be overwhelmed by the goods of this world. Now, it would be dangerous, of course, to go to the other extreme and say that the devil and demons don't exist and can't do anything. And many people in their, in their disbelief actually open themselves up to being influenced, and the most ca extreme cases possessed, through superstitious practices like palm reading and tarot cards and Ouija boards, you know, things like that. They think, well, this is harmless because it's, it's not real at all. It's just a game. But actually, by not acknowledging the possibility of demonic activity, they open themselves naively up to it. Um, I want to say a little bit about the choirs of angels, because people, uh, you know, think, okay, 
How many angels are there? How are they organized? What's that look like? And this is an image that sort of depicts the choirs of angels. And through the scriptures and also through some sort of reflection in the church fathers, especially um, with Pseudo-Dionysius, there's kind of divisions drawn about the choirs of angels. And basically in general, we're given nine names in the scriptures and working with that sort of guided in faith. This is not anything, you know, terribly conclusive, but sort of the tradition that's emerged in that is that there are nine choirs of angels and they're grouped in sort of subgroups of three. So at the top, you have the seraphim, cherubim, thrones, and they're really given over to the worship of God exclusively. But then sort of underneath that, you have dominations, virtues, and powers. I like them because they're like the Dominican angels. Because um, they're, you know, they do like a whole lot of worship of God, but they're also able to like go out and do stuff, you know, um, be able to, to send to, to on ministries, sent on missions by the Lord. And then there are the ones, let's say, we're more familiar with, the principalities, archangels, and angels. Um, you know, we tend to think of the archangels, St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael, as being at the top. But I'm not necessarily sure, I don't necessarily think that's the case. There's a special role, of course, of St. Michael in his patronage over the human race. And there's a special reason we're given to pray to him um, through the liturgical tradition, devotional tradition of the church. Um, but um, it's not exactly, you know, the way we think. I think, and this is where it's important to think about, okay, well, how many names do we have for individual angels? This is where I think, well, because we're given to know St. Michael, St. Gabriel, and St. Raphael as the archangels, because we're given their names, we have a special sort of responsibility to pray to them by name, you know? If we're going to, as well as our own guardian angel, I'll talk a little bit about the guardian angels. Um, so they're kind of belonging to the bottom rung there. And if you think about, you know, God and his wisdom and mercy has given us all an angel, all a guardian angel, every person that's ever existed, whether they become Christian or not, has a guardian angel. It's really profound. And I think, you know, although it's hard to say all of these things, we're in the area of very speculative theology, it's hard to say exactly, but these guardian angels aren't recycled either, you know. So God has created a spiritual being principally to glorify him, and to live with him and be happy with him forever. And yet that being also has designated as its principal goal outside of glorifying God, or as his, in a special way, his primary way of glorifying God when it comes to doing something, um, that guardian angel is meant to, to lead us to heaven. It's very consoling to know, I mean, to think about. So this is where you can ask, you know, don't ask what you can do for your guardian angel, but what your guardian angel can do for you, you know. And I think um, with using some principles from Aquinas, it's reasonable to think that our guardian angels are involved in a whole bunch of different things, in, in warding off the dangers of body and soul uh, that we have, in enlightening us and spurring us on to good. Again, not by, not by implanting ideas in our minds, so much as giving us images, you know. I think that angels have helped preachers throughout the centuries a great deal by giving them images, um, images they can use to explain the faith. And this is where I think it's important to pray to our guardian angel for enlightenment. Again, God likes to use the intermediaries. He likes to use the hierarchy of things. He delights in giving goodness to other things so that they can give it to other things. That's true of us as human beings. We see that in our own lives. We see that in the church. But even in that invisible domain, that thing, the things we can't see, this is why it's important to approach the angels in faith, God is at work through our guardian angel, enlightening us, giving good things to our imagination. Our guardian angels, it seems, can also counteract the influence of demons. Also, they can intercede and strengthen our prayers um, the way like a saint can intercede. And also, this is my favorite, they can correct us. <laughs> this is a list that comes not from Aquinas, this list of things I gave you. Not exactly from Aquinas, but from one of his commentary, commentators later on. So our guardian angels can ward off dangers, they can enlighten us, they can counteract the influence of demons, intercede for us, 
and fraternally correct us or angelically correct us. <coughs> Wanted to mention the guardian angels too. This is an image from uh, the Cloisters Museum, the Met Cloisters Museum. And uh, I think it's just really cool. It's St. Michael. Um, it's really amazing what artists can come up with as an image for the demons. Um, this is not a friendly looking character here at the bottom, but he's getting the spear through the mouth there. Um, so, like I said, I think, you know, it's important to, to think about the archangels, and there's, there's a reason we're given their names and no one else's, you know. It's like an incredible mystery to think of the billions of angels that God has created whose names we don't even know, and yet he gives us three to think about. And this is another interesting point, that he doesn't give us the name of our own guardian angel. So what, what do we do? How do we pray to him? We, say, we pray to our guardian angel. We say, guardian angel, help, help this to happen. Guardian angel, enlighten me. However you want to say that. Angel of God, my guardian dear. So I want to kind of bring things sort of to a conclusion. Oh, I have more here about the guardian angels. There's that list. See, I'm very bad at keeping up with my own slides. <laughs> I'm not used to having like a, a nice presentation in my, in, behind me like this. This is a um, Caravaggio painting. It's a much bigger one, but I cropped out this image of, it's from the flight of, um, the flight into Egypt, rest along the, the way in the flight into Egypt. This was on display in DC a couple years ago. Uh, and so you have the image of the Blessed Virgin on the other side of cradling Jesus. They're both sort of sleeping. And an angel is doing the music, the lullaby music. It's actually a particular piece of music that he's painted in there. Um, and St. Joseph <laughs> is holding the music for the angel, which is pretty cool. I just love St. Joseph is wide-eyed, and the donkey that's a witness to it all in the background is wide-eyed, too. <laughs> so you might find it rather disappointing that our knowledge of the angels is so limited. But again, I want to go back to that principle that the least knowledge of the highest things brings the greatest joy. And you may in particular be disappointed that it's almost impossible for you to say if and when an angel or demon has acted in your life. And this is where the Christian tradition, in particular through faith, opens one up to an immensely influential domain of reality. And so, while we can't know anything really about the particulars in our lives, I want to end with this point by taking two different principles we do know sort of multiplying them together. One is that, like I said, God likes to use intermediaries, instruments. But another point of part, a part of that is that the greater that intermediary is, the higher they are up on, let's say, the hierarchy of creation, then the greater their influence, the greater their causality. So we can have a general confidence that the angels are constantly at work. And their influence is much greater than even who we regard as the big people of this world, right? Think of, think of how many angels outrank world leaders. This is where the guardian angels of world leaders become a, have, have an important role to play. The other point, so that's one, the other point to multiply by this is just that, well, St. Thomas asks, how many angels are there? I already made the point about the guardian angels, there being one for every human being that's ever lived, ever will live. But that's, again, remember, they're just one subset of angels. So think about this, that there are literally billions and billions of angels, each of different grades. So billions of angels at work forming, in a way, this vast domain of creation, which, yes, we don't see, yes, we don't have certain knowledge of in the particulars, but in faith, we have a tremendous confidence that this is all at work in an incredible symphony, a symphony that, that God orchestrates and that he does so to our salvation. So there are billions of angels beholding the face of God and billions watching over humanity. So, thank you. So as is our custom, we'll go ahead and take um, like a five to seven minute break and then come back for the Q&A session.
Oh, good. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started with uh, questions. Can I go first? Sure. <laughs> He's got that. Uh, oh, no, He's I don't want it. It's for the sake of the people who might listen to the recording. Okay, yeah. thank you. I have one question. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any idea what uh, uh, an angel's IQ or intelligence mm. quote didn't, would be? Isn't that yeah. stupid? I think oh, off the charts is the right <laughs> word. Yeah. That's a good question. So it's, yeah, how smart would an angel measure? I think that's, it's almost just like an entirely different, um, different scale. Yeah, like I remember, um, I'm a dog person that's probably come out already. Um, but I remember, you know, looking through and having this book about measuring the intelligence of your dog, you know, and there's different things you can do to see the responsiveness to different, you know, stimuli. So. So with the dogs, um, it's like we're not going to give them an IQ test, a human IQ test, right? Because it's completely different scale. So if you can kind of transfer that and think, in a way to measure the angel's intelligence, it's of a completely. It's not just a difference of degree, you know, like the numbers higher. Okay. It's like a completely different sort of environment and reality, and yeah. So okay. not as much as God, but much more than us. <laughs> So, you can come back later for a, for a second oh. question later. <laughs> do you think maybe they have anything to do with talent? Meaning, could you explain that a little bit more? Like, pardon? Could you? So, what sort of talent? Like, Any. does an I angel mean, help me to have Some people have an affinity for music, some oh, for art, sure. some science. Yeah. Yeah. There aren't all that many that can do everything. Sure. No, I think that that's a definite possibility. You know, the angels help people to do what they're good at better, you know. Um, I read a book about angels not too long ago. can't remember anybody who writes anything. But um, it said that the the top angel, who's the first one? Seraphim. The seraphim, yeah that their main job is to just give glory to God. That's right. Yeah. It. That's, That's it. That's right. Yeah. And there's um, a connection there with the word for their name, seraphim, which means to, to like burn or it's connection to fire. And there's something um, that, so one of the main sources for all the stuff on angels in the Middle Ages is pseudo Dionysius. Uh, he was supposed to be pseudo Dionysius. So. Um, a guy that called himself Dionysius, like the one in the scriptures that followed St. Paul. But turns out later on, he's a much later author. Anyway, he's a really important guy. Um, but his point on this is that the reason the seraphim have that name is because they're the closest to the Holy Spirit. You know, they're in a way the closest, not that they compare to God, because they're still infinitely below God, but just as the Holy Spirit... Um, is the living flame of love. Um, there's a connection there with the seraphim. So, anyway. Then it talks about the cherubim having six wings. Right, that's um, in the book of Daniel, I believe. Um, my scripture is on display here. Uh, yeah, that's in the scriptures. Okay. I have four. I'll outline them. <laughs> sure. Um, do you want to ask them all together? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. The first is the sign of, a, I've heard that a sign uh, that if it's the devil, mm -hmm. that there's a great deal of angst and anxiety and mm -hmm. lack of peace. And that's somehow how you can tell if it's, mm -hmm. you're being influenced. That's one. And then um, angels appeared in the scripture in bodily form. Um, 
I've heard lots of, and I have my own, which I won't share, but angels appearing in bodily form to help someone. Mm -hmm. And then, it, what are your thoughts on that? Or, mm -hmm. And I've also heard that demons can't read our minds. I want mm -hmm. to know if you've heard mm -hmm. that. And if that's true, is that also true of our guardian angels? Mm -hmm. And then there was once a priest a long time ago, Monsignor Faisal. I don't know if any of you here may remember him, but he was a very, very holy, gentle, humble man in his 90s. And he called his guardian angel John, and he mm -hmm. recommended we call our angel something. And I don't mm -hmm. know if that's proper. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yep. <laughs> Good for you. Um, so to the, the first question was whether we can know that the devil is at work in our lives because we're suddenly filled with a lack of peace and anxiety and angst. I would say that may very well be the case, but I'll stick to my earlier point, you know, which is just that there can be other reasons that we're full of anxiety and angst, and um, those can be on the, the human level, you know. And again, we want to be leery of extremes, right? I'm not saying the devil can never be involved in that or that that's never a sign that this is something bad um, it's just I don't want to run to too quick of a conclusion you know I get a little bit nervous or a little bit uncomfortable when people seem to claim a kind of absolute certain knowledge of what the devil is doing in their life you know um, where it's just like revelation gives us everything we need to know for our salvation you know Jesus is revealed in the scriptures and in sacred tradition, everything we need for our salvation, but not necessarily everything we need to satisfy our curiosity <laughs> or every question to our own you know, personal situation. And that's where I think we just have to, well, really be humble about the limits of our knowledge. You know, if I needed to know this in order to get to heaven, Jesus will provide the way for me to know. You know in fact, he already has in the deposit of faith. So that's where we just have to be a little bit humble about it. But Certainly. I mean, uh, again, the other extreme is, no, it's never the devil. It's just in your head. You know, I don't want to, I'm not advocating that either. So, uh, angels certainly appear in bodily form in the scriptures. Uh, and yes. So like, yeah, that's, that's clear. Like, okay, here's the angel. Um, this is an angel acting, you know. Um, I mean, discerning exactly what's going on there and whether, let's say, a demon could appear as an angel of light. This is, you know, also possible. It's just, um, this doesn't happen very often. I'm thinking, speaking in like the ordinary human case of like, well, I don't really know anyone personally who has had an angel appear to them. Maybe, maybe I do. Maybe they haven't told me. Um, it's the kind of thing where we, we sort of maintain, importantly, this is possible. This can totally happen. At the same time, I'm not going to be the judge of whether it has or not, you know, in this particular case. So we have just have a little bit of, I think, humility in that on our part. That's, that's my attitude. Um, uh, it's true. Angels and demons can't read our inner thoughts um, because, it, like I said, that belongs to the inner core of the person. This is where talking about angels brings out all these questions about the human person, which I think is very, very important. One of the most important being that what's deepest in us is not our emotional life, but actually that life of knowing and choosing our intellect and our will, our mind and our heart. And that, uh, as the kind of inner spiritual core of us, is not available to the, to the direct sight of the angels or demons. So you, know, you think, well, I, what if I wanted my guardian angels to know everything? I'm thinking, well, you can talk to him. Um, now, the, the caveat to that is that, um, and I think this is, St. Thomas says something like this, that through a kind of inference, an angel or demon may surmise something about what we're thinking because they see the visible change, you know. Um, they see that, um, you know, whenever someone in the room, we, who, there's, whenever we're in the room with someone who really annoys us, we start like twitching, you know, uh, or something like that, you know. We all, uh, they know our tells. They'd be, you wouldn't want to play poker with them, you know, um, in other words, in other words. so. Um, so you could see how that's like, not directly, no, but just as we can know a lot about someone else by sort of reading their body language, an angel can know that by reading our body and emotional life. Um, um, I, 
I am just going to, so answering the question about the guardian angels, um, this is where I think it's just important that the tradition sort of maintains, like, be careful assigning names to creatures that are higher than you, you know. Our guardian angel isn't our pet. We don't get to name him. And I think there's a kind of, there's a kind of um, uh, humility we need to have in, in that. I haven't really thought through the consequences of what, you know, naming your own angel and, and the dangers involved in that, that you may be calling the name of something else. I just don't think it's for us to do, you know. I think that perhaps some of the holy people in history and saints have maybe more about their guardian angel has been revealed to them directly than, than we're going to know. Some saints have seen their guardian angels, uh, been able to do that. But I think we should have a kind of humility, lest we begin to think, you know, I mean, but, uh, but this is a common th thing, right? Like, I remember being told in like fifth grade, okay, we'll draw a picture of your guardian angel. You know, you know I, I should have at that point called the teacher's bluff and submitted a blank paper. Um, and uh, I, I was already sarcastic enough as a kid, but then we were encouraged to name them. And it's like, okay, let's just not, that's getting a little bit weird, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's two words, so it sounds kind of strange, but yeah. Um, I think that was the end. So, no, I think daily even, it's a good thing, just as we invoke the saints every day, um, to, to pray to St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael, and your guardian angel. Like, to just make that a habit of your regular prayers, I think it's a very good practice. It kind of keeps you in touch, you know, once a day. It's pretty good. So, anyway, go ahead. Um, just this is a little confusion I have is that Padre Pio says mm -hmm. to send your guardian angel to him for you. Yes. Wow. Okay. After he's passed away. Okay. I mean, it's in the journals and the writings, sure. and he even says to name your guardian yeah. angel. But I've always okay. heard what you have said. Okay. So I think there's just a lot out there. Yeah. Because it's coming a bit with the authority of a saint there. I just don't see the larger kind of agreement amongst theologians as this being a good idea, which is why I'm hesitant to. Well, that's what I, I was you know. thinking. Like, what do I, what if it I sounds think? a little strange, it's okay. better, it, it might be, so it's better just to leave it alone. <laughs> um, I was wondering can you pray to other people's guardian angels? Say, for example, they don't believe. Mm -hmm. in the guardian angel or they don't have the faith can you ask that guardian angel to guide them watch over them this is this is why i love talking about the angels because inevitably like a really interesting and insightful like remark comes in absolutely i mean i would say absolutely and you know um that that maybe is a very good strategy for evangelization you know um so that's a great insight yeah because that's the thing how irreligious someone looks. We know that God has assigned an angel to them. You, know, as their guardian. you mentioned that um, guardian angels can correct us. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do they do that? Or what? Yeah. I mean, that, that intrigued me. I, I, yeah. I mean, is it just like with a, a thought or with a... Um, so not with a thought in terms of like a pure idea. Right. Um, but in terms of suggesting an image to us, you know... Um, also, I mean, I think it's completely within the realm of, of pious reflection that angels can give you a little bit of a jolt sometimes, you know? Um, like, yes, maybe sometimes that is just our psychology brimming, you know? But in other times, it's like, okay, that was out of nowhere, it seemed. You know, I was, you know, knocked and moved away from some bad thought, or uh, I was dismissive of some person and uh, immediately a thought that humbled me came to mind. You know, or just immediately, you know, again, it can be God acting directly, but knowing how much he likes to use intermediaries, I think very often it is the angels. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, I was told several times that countries, dioceses, mm -hmm. even maybe parishes yeah. have their own guardian angels, right. meaning the people that inhabit those places, I suppose. But would you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. I heard mm -hmm. that the children of Fatima 
received the Holy Eucharist from the Portugal uh, guardian angel. From the angel of guardian Portugal. of Portugal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I think that that is, um, to go back, I have this nifty device. Um, to go back to this, I think that's where, I mean, I haven't read this closely, so I can't give you a, a great answer, but I think that's where, while the angels down here may refer to guardian angels directly, I think that's where, especially, like I said, the, the mixed angels here, the Dominican sort of angels that, I think that's where you can go up higher. Um, and those, let's say, because it's a more important role, would be assigned to higher angels. Um, the guardianship of a city, uh, of a church, you know, of a country. Yeah. So, principalities. Principalities. Yeah. <laughs> what exactly do principalities do? Um, they take care of cities and countries. And <laughs> yeah. Small islands. Yeah. <laughs> there is a description I mean really what with the choirs of angels we're given a name from scripture and that's it and as with many of the patristic uh, authors like there's always a reflection on that and uh, and even a kind of etymology worked out in that so if you were to read St. Thomas who's like very open about well there's different ways we could set this up there's the authority of pseudo Dionysius over here there's the authority of St. Gregory over here and they have different orders. They're like, well, how do we reconcile this? They're the guardian, the angels are ranked differently for them. And so he masterfully says, well, in one way, you can see this, this, and this, and that's the better model. And in another, this one also has its strengths and this, this, this. And he goes through and tells you at least a little bit about each rank of angels. So that would be fun to go through in more detail. But again, it's the thing where we're dealing with very much with the limits of our knowledge. It's, you know, um, it's neat to know that there are distinct grades. And uh, one thing I haven't talked about is that each angel is its own species, so that the angels differ from one another immensely more than we differ from one another, because we're all members of, we all have a common human nature that we share. Um, one way to think of it is the reason that we're, you know, we all have a common human nature, but we're, through our bodies, different instantiations of that human nature, whereas the angels are their own species because there's no like matter that separates them from that other species. There can only be one of each species, uh, which is another like thing to think about. Not only is there's this entire kind of invisible symphony at work, but it's also um, so much more colorful and beautiful than any of the material things that we see, just because it's diverse. You know, it's like God manifesting his goodness through a diversity of different ways. Um, so. Um, I, I've never, uh, of course, seen an angel, and I'm just fine with that. Uh, I, I, angels seem to be sentimentalized a lot uh, with uh, everybody having cherubs all over their sure. walls and in sure. their gardens and things. I believe, recalling years back, I worked with a girl who didn't believe in God, but she believed in angels, <laughs> and I couldn't figure that out. Sure. But, uh, you know, I'm pretty no-nonsense about things, but uh, there's an there's a anecdote in my family. I live in my grandparents' house, and there's a room in the house next door where in the 30s, uh, a no-nonsense Irish lady, Mrs. Callahan, lived, and my no-nonsense grandmother lived next door, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a sick boy in the family who had mm -hmm. been sick during the 30s with, like, rheumatic fever. And uh, so one day my grandmother was hanging laundry, and she told me that Mrs. Callahan came out and was just ecstatic, saying that uh, her son would be healed because she went in to give him his lunch in the dark room, and there was a glowing figure beside his bed, and he mm -hmm. was sure, she was sure that it was an angel coming as a sign that he'd be well. Mm -hmm. And she, my grandmother, believed it because she was a no-nonsense lady, and went in and came back out and the boy had died mm. and she found him dead so what mm. would be could there been a would a guardian angel escort a body or a mm. soul or was that a gift for the mother perhaps or certainly I never thought of that mm. as something um, ominous or demonic but rather something right. positive right. and and uh, one of the I asked the son who was older than me by many years about it one time in St. Mary's yeah. Festival and he recalled that story as well right. right what what would you think of moments like that well, I think we certainly ask for the presence of the holy angels at, let's say, uh, the deathbed of someone, you know, just as we ask for the intercession of the saints. Um, I mean, I think they even mentioned the litany for the commendation of the dying, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so there's, um, you know, uh, 
we think of that as a bad moment. Oh, no, the angel's there. He's got blood on his hands. <laughs> no. But this is also, if you think about a very profound and important moment, both to assist that person in that most difficult last moment, but also in a way, I don't know how much, um, I'd have to think a bit through the metaphysics of accompanying a soul. Um, yeah. uh, but certainly by, by kind of influence and guidance. I don't, I'd have to think through the, the spatiality of like actually what would it mean to accompany for one spirit to accompany another, yeah. um, which had just been in ha- had just been um, or, or, to do a body? Yeah. Or, or might have been uh, another thought that it might have been a gift for the mother, a uh, piece mm-hmm. that uh, sure. she to had witnessed this. Yeah, to be able to see. So, I'd like to end by eight there. So, just do two more questions would be good. Recently, I read something about, um, I know a lot of people that are active in the anti-abortion movement, Mm -hmm. and that at the time of creation, God already had in his mind the whole plan Mm -hmm. at one time. So Mm -hmm. he knew how many babies were going to ever be born, Mm -hmm. and, and... guardian angel was created at the same time mm-hmm. for that one and like there's this pull I, uh, in my imagination mm-hmm. there's this pool of guardian angels waiting for their baby to be born mm-hmm. and when the day comes if that baby is aborted mm-hmm. then that angel never has an opportunity mm-hmm. to do what his mission was supposed mm-hmm. to be right but maybe that soul has another job to do even if it's aborted if it's already got a guardian angel so there's probably another something else going right. on there we don't know about it. a whole bunch of different questions yeah, yeah. <laughs> we start thinking so um but it's good no this is healthy exercise to be curious and to speculate um I'll just say the one thing that, that that reminds me is that there is some disagreement about whether um, a guardian angel is assigned, let's say, at someone's conception or at their birth. And there's a little bit, I think St. Thomas Aquinas, um, if I recall, was leaning more towards it being assigned at birth. So anyway, that's all I have to say kind of in response to that. So, thank you. Thank you. Last question or? Thank we can chat afterwards, you. sorry. Did St. Thomas Aquinas have any kind of hypothesis about how the fallen angels could possibly have made Mm -hmm. that choice? It's actually this kind of thing. um, It's it's an interesting thing to look at the medieval theologians just on that question and to kind of, okay, what does this one think? What does this one think? Does this one think? Um, Yes, he has quite a bit to say, uh, and there's different ways to go. I don't have it fresh in my mind. There's different ways to think about it. Um, I'm not sure if it's the St. Thomas, but um, one way to think of it, let's say, is that the angels were shown the plan of the incarnation and the salvation of the human race. And realizing that God would take on human nature, which was beneath them, Lucifer reacted in a kind of pride that, well, let's say he would be outranked by something with a human nature who's visible, you know. Um, so that's one theory. Um, I'm forgetting the others off the top. I don't have the, that's its own like very important and complicated theological kind of dispute. Uh, and one where people have very different ideas, uh, but an interesting one. Uh, so anyway, I don't have it fresh in mind, but there's different ways to tease it out. We know that it, the, the sin of the angels wouldn't be um, a material kind of uh, temptation. It wouldn't be a sin of the flesh because, you know, Angels aren't tempted by lust or gluttony or any of that because they don't have bodies. So it would have to be a spiritual sin, you know, uh, especially a pride. You know, I think that's clear. Uh, so anyway, maybe we should go ahead and end there. And if, if there's still some questions lying out there, please uh, feel free to ask me afterwards. But thank you all for coming. Thank you.